We're considered the poorest county in the state and even on national level, we're listed as a third world country here. It's pitiful what's happened to this county over the years. And our county looks like a, a ghost town, really. We're the first county in West Virginia to sue three companies that, uh, that they were sending all these uh, appeals out to the depressed areas and things. think that they're these tatted up guys walking around the streets, pants hanging down, never held a job, or just lying around and in an alley shooting up heroin, and that's not the case. You know, these are kids who are in a mechanical engineering program at WVU, or healthcare professionals, or lawyers, and that's kind of what my program does, is educating the public just about this very question that you asked me. It's like, what do these people look like, you know? They could look like you, they could look like me. They could be employed doing something very similar to what you do. You know, we see cases where millions of pills are shipped into one tiny little pharmacy in a tiny little town, a yep. population mm -hmm. of 300 people. Yeah. Should alarms be going off somewhere? Absolutely. Absolutely. Probably nine out of 10 cases that we're involved with is, is drug related. And I see people that I grew up with. I see people that I went to school with and see neighbors, you know, and these are good people through surgeries and they've got addicted to drugs and it's taken over their life. And because drugs are so uh, easily available on the streets and down through the pharmaceutical companies flooding uh, West Virginia and flooding our county here of McDowell, and then people just turn to drugs. You are in the Gary area. This area is known as the Gary Bottom. This used to be the richest, largest coal mining operation in the world. There are pill houses all around here. I've been there, so I know how it feels to want that next fix, that next Hi, that next feeling of trying to feel normal. Leslie was standing on the street corner every day, begging for money, every day. That was her job. You would come down the street and you would see her chasing cars. Give me a quarter. There's no jobs, there's no hope. And see, when you live in a world with no hope, you'll do anything to try to bring hope into your life. And I think they have used drugs as a formal way of coping with what used to be. I no longer wanted to feel. I didn't want to feel the pain, the mental issues that I was going through. It seemed to cover it up to take it away that I didn't have to think about it. And all too many times have we sold them to pay electric bills, to get food, to do things that we need to do. They were there while sitting be hungry. And it, not, it just doesn't take from the poor side of walk of life. It takes no, from all of us. Like I practiced mind. emergency medicine uh, here at Grant Memorial Hospital for many years saved a lot of lives. The only kind of passion that I had was I liked uh, racing, I liked cars, fast cars, and uh, this one time that it was pouring rain and you know 160 miles an hour lost control of the car and went straight into the guardrail, this, this metal guardrail, and just demolished the car. The very next day I had to be kind of back at work in the ER and I tried to call, hey can you cover me, no one's covering me and I'm in tremendous pain so I took hydrocodone out of the out of the sample closet and I remember immediately feeling just not only was my pain gone but I felt like energy I feel euphoria and uh, you know the next day I took more because I still had back pain the samples that were available there I consumed them all and uh, then I started writing prescriptions I wrote them in different individuals names and this, this may have been a period of three, three and a half years. Basically the DEA started doing an investigation and they looked and they saw this pattern of him writing these prescriptions in different names, the same names again and again and again. My uh, sentence was 48 months 
and I served like two and a half years, a little more than two and a half years. My mother's a prescription junkie because she has a doctor that screams, every time she screams for pain, they write her a prescription. Now it's much better than it used to be, but years ago, you used to say, I knocked my pills in the toilet, and guess what? You got another they prescription. Write you another prescription. I called the Attorney General's office and asked them what could be done, that we're being targeted because of our economic situation that we're in. And I felt that's no different than uh, drug dealers out here targeting people that, you know, that's got a problem. All they're looking for is the money. What is the topic that you want to tell us about? What today? I wanted to talk about today, Steve, is prescription drug diversion in hospice. So what changed for me, number one, was in prison I received research. I had my son, my wife, my family, my friends send me anything, anything on drug diversion, anything on doctor shopping. So that really intrigued me, like why don't I know this? You know, why, why can I not get a medical expert to come in here and talk to me about this? Because there is no one. And I wanted to be that medical expert, and so that I took that on as my life's mission. The economics is what drives this. So the laws are starting to tighten up. But we've waited so long to this whole country is just about addicted to drugs. And now we're trying to find answers for it and you know, it's not gonna come. As, as long as it took to get it established, it's gonna take that long to get it uh, de-escalated now, the problems that we're facing.